thank you and praise you for the testimony of that song praising my savior all the day long we know father everyone here that knows christ as savior cannot go a day without saying thank you and praising our wonderful savior that we have father we thank you for the work on the cross on behalf of our sins thank you for salvation through jesus christ thank you for the hope of the resurrection of eternal life through his name Thank you for our promise that we have an eternal home waiting for us and for the hope that someday, Lord, you're going to send, come back and take us home to be with you. And we thank you and praise you for that. Truly something to praise the Lord all the day long for. But Father, as we continue to sing songs of praise, we pray that you receive this from our hearts, Lord. And as always, when Pastor Kelly comes up, Lord, use that message to challenge us to want to live a closer and to have a closer walk with you. And if there's someone here that does not know Christ or somebody watching over the internet does not know Christ as Savior, it's our hearts desire. We know it's your will, Father, for that person to be saved. We pray that you convict them and draw them close to you. Bless the time now as we continue singing it in songs of praise. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. How great thou art. Amen? Amen. amen. <clears throat> sing on a second verse.
may be seated. <laughs> As you know, on this song, I'll sing the first line. We all do the repeat line on.
Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Lord, as we come before you today, we would ask that you'd give comfort to uh, Pam's family today. May you encourage their hearts, as well as giving comfort to the church family today, Lord, as uh, Pam was a very uh, integral part of the church body here and loved by all. And Father, we pray that you'd just uh, minister to us as well as her family. And uh, Lord, I pray that uh, through her, her death that you'll receive glory uh, somehow, some way. And uh, Father, we ask that you'd be with other folks who have been sick. We ask that you would give each one of them strength this morning. Pray for Jenna today and her high blood pressure. Lord, we would ask that you would uh, give her healing uh, with that. And Lord, we just give you praise for all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Anybody got something you want to thank the Lord for this morning before we get into the message today? Jenna? Amen. Amen. Amen to that. Anybody else? Steve? The whole family. Amen. That's awesome. Great. Sherry? Yes. Amen. Amen. Jason? Yes, amen. Yeah, we need to continue to pray for that young boy that's got uh, cancer. Uh, Bobby Ann. Anybody else? Mom? I thank God for everyone present. I have just my heart beat with such glad feelings. I can see how it feels. And now I can say my beautiful friend, God is love. <laughs> I don't know where she'll be eating dinner today, but I'm sure somebody will feed her. <laughs> Good thing my wife is the cook in the house. That's all I can say. <laughs> That's great. Anybody else something you want to thank the Lord for this morning? Keith? Good fellowship each Saturday morning here at Rose. Yes. Uh, and then some getting married and, and Amen. And then some coming to work in the building afterwards. Yes. Amen. Good. Anybody else something you want to thank the Lord for? Len? I want to thank the Lord because I have a little family. Amen. Yes. A little jealous this morning, aren't we? <laughs> Absolutely. So we'll give you the details uh, for the viewing and the service at the end of the service this morning. Anybody else? All right. Well, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and open them up to Hebrews chapter 12 this morning. We've been doing a little mini series on uh, the attitude, and it seems a little warm in here this morning. Hebrews chapter 12, and so we entitled today's message, Mayday, Mayday, My Attitude is Losing Altitude. And I'm sure that doesn't represent anybody in here this morning, but just in case, uh, we're going to focus in on that this morning. But if you have ever flown, you have probably experienced a bit of what is called turbulence. Sometimes that turbulence is referred to as hitting or compared to hitting a pothole while you're driving. Uh, a few years back, Tamara and I took Fred and Judy out to Arizona, and that was the first time Fred had ever flown, and uh, we hit a little bit of turbulence on that flight, and Fred got a little nervous, and uh, the stewardess said, don't worry about it, it's just like hitting a pothole when you're driving. And uh, of course, you know, when you hit a pothole when you're driving, you don't have to worry about falling out of the sky several thousand feet. Uh, so there is a little bit of difference between hitting some turbulence and a pothole. But several years ago, I took a flight out of Providence, Rhode Island, out to Kansas City, Missouri, and uh, it was a very windy day. And so as the, the plane took off, it was a rough takeoff. It was shaking and bouncing, and there was actually people on the plane that were screaming. 
I mean, that's how rough of a takeoff it was. And the only thing I could think of is, I sure hope they don't show the movie Airplane on this flight. <laughs> I didn't think it would go over very well. But just as flying has its rough days, so does life. A smooth day is really an exception. It's not the norm when you think about it, especially if you have teenagers. Flying straight and level usually comes as a recovery from a climb or uh, a descent or from making a turn. Flying level is really an exception to flying. Uh, it's just that middle part of the flight. As we look at this series, continue the series on the attitude this morning, I want us to discover what we can do when we're having one of those rough, turbulent days and some things we can do to prevent those days. And sometimes they're more than days, aren't they? Sometimes they're weeks, sometimes they're months, and sometimes, for some folks, they're years. And so uh, what can we do? So we don't have to cry, mayday, mayday, my attitude is losing altitude. And so the first thing we can do is this, maintain the right attitude. Uh, Hebrews chapter 12, if you're uh, there with me this morning, Hebrews chapter 12 is where we're going to start in uh, verses 1 and 2. It says, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with, what's the next word? Patience. patience, the race that is set before us. Run with patience. That's a good attitude to maintain uh, when you're going through some struggles, when you're going through some turbulent times. Our natural reaction when we hit a rough patch of weather, so to speak, in this life, is sometimes wanting to bail out on the rough weather, to bail out on the right attitude in order to compensate for the problem. During the tough times, our attitude is critical to our stability. During the tough times, we're tempted to panic, and when we do that, we are oftentimes going to make bad decisions in those moments of panic. When we crash, it oftentimes comes from making a bad reaction to the turbulence of life. The turbulence doesn't cause the crash. It's our reaction to the turbulence. It's our reaction to the tough times. And so as we maintain an attitude of patience, it's important to remember what happens inside of us is more important than what's happening on the outside of us. Always focus more upon the inside than on the outside. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 10 and 11, if you want to jog over there with me. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 10 and 11. We well, see the attitude of the Apostle Paul. 2 Timothy 3, verses 10 and 11. He says, but thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience, persecutions, afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, what persecutions I endured, but out of them all the Lord delivered me. <clears throat> so Paul said, hey, the Lord delivered me from all of these hardships. But in the midst of that list, you noticed he said there, you have known my patience. Paul never yelled, at least it's not recorded for us, the words, I quit. He never yelled the words, I'm leaving, I'm out of here. He never said it was too hard or too rough. He, that, that, that it's just too hard, I'm going to quit. Uh, he never said, uh, I got my feelings hurt. It's, again, we don't have it recorded. We read, a, we read a couple of weeks ago the whole list of struggles and pa, the things that Paul went through. And uh, here in this passage, he just kind of gives us a, a summary of it all. But the, I think the key here is he says, the Lord delivered me out of them all. He was able to maintain the right attitude and experience that deliverance. Over in James chapter 1, 
verses 2 to 4, we find another great attitude to have uh, when we're going through the turbulent times of life. James chapter 1, verses 2 to 4. It says, uh, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations or many types of temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. There's that word again. But let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. You see, to count it all joy when you're going through trials and struggles is a decision that you must make. It's a decision that, that I must make. It's an attitude that we choose to have when we're going through those hard times. The reason the trying of our faith worketh patience is because patience matures us and grows us. The word perfect there in verse 4, let patience have her perfect word. That word perfect means complete. In other words, as we go through the turbulent times of life, with the attitude of patience, the attitude of joy, patience will work and it will bring us to a place of spiritual growth or spiritual maturity in character. It'll have its perfect work. And then it uses the word entire. That word means complete in every part, perfectly sound. In other words, we will become a well-rounded believer in every aspect of life. Now, I can tell you this morning I am well-rounded, but not as James is talking about this morning. I'm well-rounded because of my appetite. That's not the well-rounded James is talking about. But he's simply talking about this morning just being complete, just Every area of your life, you are just, you're, you're strong, you're maturing. Uh, and then he says, wanting nothing. And that word wanting means to leave destitute. Again, you'll be well-rounded. Uh, you will find that there is no area of your life that is lacking or is undernourished spiritually or morally. Why? Because through those turbulent times, you let patience work in your life as you maintain the attitude of patience and the attitude of joy. And what you discover is, you know what? I am not destitute. I have what I need. And uh, God gets me through it. And God strengthens me. And God sustains me. And uh, listen, God will give us what we need when we need it as well. You know, don't expect God to give you something today if you don't need it till next month. Okay, the Bible was very clear. Don't worry about tomorrow, amen? We have enough problems and struggles to worry about today without worrying about tomorrow. When tomorrow comes, tomorrow will take care of itself. And if you need something different tomorrow than what you need today, if you are letting patience have its work and you've got the right attitude, then when tomorrow comes, God will give you what you need and you'll be okay. We've got to maintain the attitude of patience and joy. Second of all, realize turbulence doesn't last forever. Some of you are probably thinking, yeah, right. Then when's it going to end? But listen, that can be hard to remember sometimes. You know, when I'm flying, I really don't like it when the pilot comes on and says, Please fasten your seatbelts and remain seated until further notice. Those are words I don't like to hear, especially when you know the plane has reached its altitude and the flight is supposed to be smooth and everything's supposed to be going good and they're supposed to be coming around with the, the cart of soda and that little bag of peanuts that's going to last you about 30 seconds. You know, you're thinking everything's supposed to be good. Why is he telling me to stay in my seat and put on the seatbelt? Typically, though, as the plane gets out of the rough weather, the pilot gets back on and says, Folks, the weather has calmed down. The turbulence has calmed down. You can remove your seatbelt and feel free to move around the cabin. And it's like, ah, oh, thank you. Turbulence doesn't end forever. And neither do the storms of life. As one preacher said, he said, thank God the Bible says it came to pass, it didn't come to stay. 
And so praise the Lord for that. It doesn't last forever. But truth is, the turbulence, the troubles of life can wear us down. Many times it's not the size of the problem, but it's the duration of the problem that starts to wear on us. But remember Galatians chapter 6 and verse 9. It says, Be not weary in well-doing. For in due season we shall reap if we faint not. See, if we give up before the sowing and the growing process is complete, then we're not going to be able to reap. If, if, we, if we give up, that would be like planting a garden, and that time will be coming around soon. But could you imagine planting a garden? You're out there in the spring, you get the soil all tilled up, you get all the weeds pulled out, you get your plants in, you're in, you know, July now, and, and everything is looking good. The tomatoes have these really big green tomatoes on it, and you can see they're just starting to turn red. And you decide, I'm tired of staking the tomatoes. I'm tired of pulling the weeds. I'm tired of pulling the little suckers off of the plants. I'm just going to go ahead and yank these tomato plants out of the ground and throw them over the bank. Now, how many of you would really do that? Well, you know, that's exactly what it would be like when we bail out in the midst of the troublesome times in our life. He says there in Galatians chapter 6, don't get weary in your well-doing. In due season, you will reap if you don't faint. Before a runner catches their second wind, I'm told this. I can't tell you this by experience, so I could be wrong. But before they can get their second wind, sometimes it can get a little tough on them. Sometimes the side can hurt hurt, and things of that nature. But once they get that second wind, it's almost as if they could run all day long. The first part is difficult. It's painful. But the last part is easier for them, and it's fruitful. In the same way with you and I, as we go through the turbulent times of life, it might be a struggle. It might be difficult. But hang in there and stay strong and stay faithful because your reaping season is coming. You'll catch a second wind, I promise you, at some point or time. Just hang in there. He said in verse 2, looking unto Jesus. Listen, when the turbulence gets rough, look to Jesus. Jesus had the right attitude. In verse 2 it says, Who for the joy that was set before him, Jesus had the patience, and it says he endured the cross and despised the shame. Listen, it didn't last, uh, it, it didn't last forever. And today, Jesus is reaping the benefits, and you and I are reaping the benefits of his patience and his endurance. Today, he is seated at the right hand of the Father. What better place could there be than to be seated at the right hand of the Father? Listen, folks, the turbulence isn't going to last forever. And so we've got to maintain the proper attitude until the end, and it will pay off. And then to help prevent turbulence, learn to make preventative decisions. You know, you can make some decisions in advance to prevent some problems. You know if you hit your thumb with a hammer... It's going to hurt, amen? So you can make a preventative decision. I'm not going to hit my thumb with a hammer. You think about flying. A pilot is responsible to check the weather in his planned flight before he makes his decision to proceed. While flying, he will continue to monitor the weather. Uh, obviously, all the storms can't be avoided when flying. But the ones that can be, the pilot learns to go around those storms or to get above those storms. He makes some preventative decisions. How many turbulent times do we put ourselves through because we fail to make good decisions in life? The writer of, the Hebrew, uh, of Hebrews says there in chapter 12, we are to lay aside every weight and sin which does so easily beset us. Now, why does he tell us to lay those things aside? You know what laying those things aside? That's preventative decision-making. 
runners a lot of times will train with weights on their ankles and other things in preparation for the race day. When it comes time for the actual race, they remove all of those training devices, all those weights, so that they might get out into the race and they might run it to the best of their ability without anything holding them back or holding them down. If they fail to remove those training devices, they will in all likelihood, those devices in all likelihood, will slow them down and cause them to lose the race. And so we need to realize as the writer of Hebrews says, laying aside the weights, those weights could be compared to things that may not necessarily be sinful, but they can still slow us down or weigh us down. They can hinder us from accomplishing God's plan and God's purpose in our lives. Those things, although we may find enjoyment in them, can become a stumbling block and, they, and the cause of turbulence to us so we must make the decision to lay certain things in life aside for the greater cause of Jesus Christ. And then he also says, lay aside every sin that so easily besets us. That is a preventative decision. To live with continual sin is no doubt going to cause some turbulence in our life because eventually we will reap what we sow. When it comes time to sow the seeds of sin in our lives, it's going to cause turbulence. Listen, we can't sow seeds of sin and then pray for a crop failure. It doesn't work that way. So make good decisions to prevent some of those tough times. Make good choices today to prevent turbulence tomorrow. Third, well, that was third. Fourth, keep in contact with the control tower. If you want to avoid turbulence, stay in contact with your control tower. The writer of Hebrews says, looking unto Jesus. The control tower is the pilot's main source of information, and they stay in contact with the control tower throughout the entire flight, or a control tower. And you and I have a control tower in our life. And we need to stay in constant contact with him. His name is Jesus, and his information is passed on to us through his word. And listen, follow his word, and it'll make your flight in life a whole lot better. Psalm 119, 105 says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Listen, you want your feet going down the right path? Then you're going to have to listen to the control tower through his word. And it will be a lamp to your feet. It will be a light to your path. It's a difference between a lamp and a light. A lamp lights the immediate area around you. The light lights further down there like a spotlight gives further direction. It doesn't show you everywhere, but it, it shows you a clearer path. And so the Word of God serves to help us right in the general area every day, but it also sheds light further down the road so that we know we have a good idea of where we are heading. Verse Psalm 119 and 130 says, The entrance of thy words giveth light, it giveth understanding unto the simple. Listen, it gives light. It gives understanding. Uh, Psalm 119 and verse 9 says, Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed thereto according to thy word? Listen, occasionally the control tower may have to come on and tell the pilot, you're a little off course. You need to make an adjustment. And that's what the word of God does. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? We could say, how, are we, how can we get back on course? By taking heed thereto according to the word of God. When the word of God says, hey, you're getting out of course here. You're heading down the wrong path. Let's make an adjustment. Cleanse your way and get back in the right direction. Joshua 1.8 says, This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein, 
For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. You want to have a prosperous Christian life, and that doesn't mean you're going to have the best of this world. It just means when it comes to your Christian life, you're going to have a solid walk with God. You want to have that kind of walk? You're going to have to be involved in the Word of God in your life. Somebody said this, The Bible contains the mind of God, the state of man, the way of salvation, the doom of sinners, and the happiness of the believers. Its doctrines are holy, its precepts are binding, its histories are true, and its decisions are immutable. Read it to be wise, believe it to be safe, and practice it to be holy. It contains light to direct you, food to support you, and comfort to cheer you. It's the traveler's map, the pilgrim's staff, the pilot's compass, the soldier's sword, and the Christian's character. Here, paradise is restored, heaven opened, and the gates of hell disclosed. Christ is its grand subject, our good its design, and the glory of God its end. It should fill the memory, rule the heart, and guide the feet. Read it slowly, frequently, and prayerfully. It is a mine of wealth, a paradise of glory, and a river of pleasure. It is given to you in life, will be opened at the judgment, and be remembered forever. It involves the highest responsibility, rewards the greatest labor, and condemns all who trifle with its holy content. The book is a good book to listen to and to pay attention to. George Washington said it is impossible to rightly govern the world without the Bible. I think Washington was a pretty smart guy, amen? Lincoln said, I believe the Bible is the best gift God has ever given to man. Stay in touch with the control tower, folks, and listen to his word, and then follow it. And then watch the radar. Remember the movie Top Gun? At the end of the movie when they're all called out because of the Russian MiGs. They went out and looked like there was only two MiGs on the radar. And then there were four MiGs. And I don't know how many there ended up actually being in the, in the dogfight. But it, more and more. But if they never paid attention to the radar, they wouldn't have realized there were more MiGs than what initially had showed up. Before they knew it, they were all around him. Above them, below them, in front of them, behind them. The radar does that. And while we don't have a radar screen, we do need to be watchful. We need to have our spiritual radar open. Have your spiritual antennas up. Speaking of antennas, did you hear about the two antennas that got married? The ceremony wasn't that great, but they had awesome reception. Anyway, watch the radar. Keep your spiritual antennas up. Listen, be watchful as a child of God. Let me give you three things to be watchful. I don't have them up on the screen. Number one, watch for the enemy to pop up on the radar. 1 Peter 5, 8 says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. He's there, folks. And listen, he's not a character that's red and has horns and a pitchfork and a tail. The Bible says he is very subtle. He is sly. He is smooth. He can appear as an angel of light. And he doesn't care if he uses good things to get you out of fellowship with God. Have your radar up and watch for the enemy. Ephesians 6.11 says, Put on the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. And then down in verse 16 of Ephesians 6, it says, Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Listen, the enemy 
has some fiery darts. But we can be watchful for the enemy. And with the shield of faith, we can quench those fiery darts. We can keep them from landing in us and taking us out. Be watchful for the enemy. Second of all, be watchful for one another. So I listened to an excellent sermon this morning by one of my former classmates. Uh, he pastors Cape Cod Church up on Cape Cod. And um, he was talking about this very thing and just gave a really great historical lesson back around the days of Constantine. I won't get into all that, but what it boils down to is be watchful for one another. If you want to listen to the sermon, go to Facebook, Cape Cod, Cape Cod Church, I believe it is, and uh, you can listen to it uh, there and catch all the details. But listen, we need to be watchful for each other. 1 Corinthians 12, 25 says that there should be no schisms or divisions in the body, but that the members should have the same care one for another. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 11, Paul said, Wherefore, comfort yourselves together, edify one another, even as also ye do. And we know what Jesus told his disciples. I give you a new commandment. Love one another as I have loved you. And by this shall all men know that ye are my disciples. We need to be watchful for one another. Listen, when you notice a fellow believer drops off the radar screen, try to find them. And try to get them back on the screen. Get them back into the action. And then thirdly, watch for the coming of the Lord in the air. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, beginning in verse 13, the scripture says, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the Lord, word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Watch for his coming in the air. I promise you he's coming. How do I know? Because the word of God says so. That's how I know. One day a trumpet is going to sound. And one day the dead in Christ are going to rise. Those that knew Christ the Savior and passed this life are going to come up out of their graves. And then those who are still alive in Christ are going to be all caught up together to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. What a day to look forward to. Watch for it. He's coming. <clears throat> Watch for it because we don't know when He is coming. And uh, 1 John 2, 28 says, And now, little children, abide in Him, that when He shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before Him at His coming. Maybe when you were a child or a teenager, you were doing something and mom and dad walked around the corner or walked into the room and you were like, uh-oh, just got busted. Listen, Jesus is coming. And if we're not watching for him, if we're not living for him, it could be one of those uh-oh moments in the Christian life. Watch for him. As I said earlier, what matters is what happens within us, not what happens to us. We cannot allow the turbulent struggles of life to control or dictate how we live. We must continually look to the Lord, be led by His Word and the Spirit of God as we go through life. Realize someday life here is going to be over, and we're going to see our Savior face to face. Our sister Pam got to experience that this week she's now in his presence and it's going to happen to every one of us we're going to see him one day 
Now I'm hoping to see him through the upper taker and not the undertaker. Amen. Amen. How many of you would rather go with the upper taker than the undertaker? Amen. Amen. Let's hope. Even so, come Lord Jesus. But listen, when we see our Savior face to face, he's not going to be concerned about what was done to us in life. Listen, he allowed it to happen to us. I didn't say he sent it to us, but he permitted it to take place, whether it was good or bad. And he can use every situation in life to conform us to his image if we allow him to. What he's going to be concerned with is how did we respond and what did we do in those turbulent times of life? We're responsible for keeping our attitude from going out of control so that we do not have to cry, mayday, mayday, my attitude is losing altitude. Maybe this morning you've already put out the mayday cry. Maybe you're putting it out this morning, right now. Then get back in touch with the control tower and he'll get you flying in the right direction again and get you back on course. Maybe this morning you're not even sure heaven's going to be your home. If that's the case, then you're in a worse than a mayday, mayday situation. You're in a situation that you don't know where you're going to spend eternity and that could result in you spending eternity in hell instead of heaven. Here's what the control tower wants you to know this morning, if that's you. The control tower wants you to know that you are a sinner. The Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The control tower wants you to know that God loved you and gave his son Jesus Christ to die on the cross for your sin. And he wants you to know that if you repent of your ways and you turn to him and call upon him to forgive you and to come into your heart and life, he said he would do that for you at that very moment you call out to him. And at that moment you call out, your eternal destiny is secured and you will be set on the right eternal course. Let's pray. Father, today, as we come before you this morning, Lord, may you help us today to go through the troublesome times of life with the right attitude, an attitude of patience, an attitude of joy. Lord, help us to prevent some of those troublesome times by making good choices, by staying in control or in contact with the tower. And Lord, may you help us to watch the radar. Lord, if there be any here today who don't know Christ the Savior, they're not sure of their eternal life, I pray that today might be the day they call upon the Lord Jesus Christ to save them and to give them eternal life in heaven. May you work today as only you can, and we'll thank you in Jesus' name. As your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed this morning, so where is your attitude this morning? Where's your life? Are you crying out this morning? Mayday, mayday. My attitude is losing altitude. Or you feel like you're about to. All you got to do is get in touch with the control tower. And he'll give you the words that will get you back on course. And change your altitude and get you flying level again. And I wonder if there's any here this morning say, Pastor, would you pray for me? I'm going through some turbulent times in life right now and I feel like my attitude is losing altitude. And would you pray that I'd get in touch with the Lord and let Him get me back on path and back in the right direction that I need to be going. Would you pray for me this morning, Pastor? If that's you, just slip your hand up this morning. Thank you, several hands up this morning. Maybe you're here this morning and in all honesty, you're not sure heaven's going to be your home. And you say, Pastor, I'm not sure about that. Would you pray for me today as heads are bowed and eyes are closed? Just slip your hand up, put it back down, any at all. Pastor, would you pray for me? Thank you, I see that hand. Any others, would you pray for me? I'm not sure heaven's going to be my home. Father, this morning as we come before you, 
Lord, you've seen the hands that have been raised today. Individuals who have gone through some turbulent, troublesome times, feel like they're about to cry out, mayday, mayday, or they already have. Father, may they get back in touch with the control tower. May they listen for you to speak as they spend time in your word to keep them on the right path and in the right direction. Pray for those that are here today that don't know Christ the Savior. May today be the day that they call upon him to be their Savior. And we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together. We're going to sing the song of invitation. If you're here this morning and you need to come and have a talk with God, maybe today you just want to come today and say, God, I'm crying Mayday. I need your help. I need your redirection.